by three uh, presenters. Okay, Mark Crawford, Jack Hayden, and Andy Lawson. Um, before we get, it's okay, maybe leave the door open. Yeah, some people might come later. Okay, guys, well, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, we'd like to think that you're here for our presentation, but we're guessing you just hung about for the party afterwards. <laughs> uh, on behalf of Mike, Jack, and myself, Andy, we welcome you very much. Uh, our presentation is, uh, our workshop presentation is reevaluating how we teach note taking. Now, how many of you have classes which involve note taking? Okay. How many of you teach note taking? Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I'd be exactly the same. Note taking. Um, so we ask you about the question about whether you uh, teach note taking, partly for our own reference, but also because uh, well we're basically looking to steal your best ideas. Um, at the end of the, question, uh, the session today, we're going to ask you about that, and we're hoping that you're going to get those ideas percolating now, so that you can share them with us at the end. Now, note taking, note taking, note taking, <laughs> note taking. <laughs> We're not even sure how we write the damn concept. <laughs> so if we don't even know how to write it, then it's highly surprising that we have so much disagreement and lack of certainty regarding how we teach note-taking. And yet, note-taking is clearly a very important skill, uh, especially for our students who are, in my context, are Japanese native, English, uh, native Japanese speakers uh, with very limited exposure um, to the English language. Now, Write down what you hear. Note down the key ideas. Have you ever heard this kind of advice being given out? Mm -hmm. Have you ever given this kind of advice out? I have, shamefully. Um, for lack of anything better to tell your students. Um, this is from a well-meaning presentation available on Slide, slide, slide Player, uh, created by Rosamund Whitehead. And this it's useful in the sense of what to write down. Most of us would agree with this. It certainly strikes me as a lot more useful than the previous nuggets of wisdom. But is this the best we can do? Telling students what to write and teaching them how to write? Well, this is very, very different. Note taking, or as we should perhaps more accurately say, effective note taking, is an incredibly difficult process for anybody. I was terrible at taking notes as a university student. And of course, for non-native speakers, it's far more difficult. Consider what your students go through when they're taking notes. They're dealing with listening to a foreign language. But then, even though we tell them, try not to translate, of course they're translating. They're then evaluating, identifying what they should put into the notes. They're thinking about, OK, but what shall I write down? And even the process of writing down, they're thinking about what to spell. <coughs> They're thinking about the organisation. They even think about the presentation, how to make the notes look pretty and colourful so they're easier to revise with. And of course, all this time, they're listening again. It's a really, really complex procedure. You can see why for students that's really, really tough. So today, Mike is going to explore the challenges of note taking in a little bit more detail. He's going to take us also through some of the key aspects of previous research on the topic. Jack here is going to take a look at some of the more common textbooks for lectures that involve, uh, sorry, textbooks that involve lectures and note-taking. And following that, we'll introduce a four-step approach to teaching note-taking. But for now, I'll pass you over to my learned colleague, Michael. Okay. Keep using this. That's right. Good luck. I'll use a timer because I always tend to go over time and talk too much. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a little more information about uh, challenges of note taking. Also, give a little background about the research in the field. Uh, so, there is a relatively large body of research in L1 contexts about note taking. I did a search on Google Scholar. Are you familiar with Google Scholar? Mm -hmm. And got about 17,000 hits. Now, obviously, there's not 17,000 individual articles about note taking. 
Uh, so there's some overlap, there's some stuff that's kind of extraneous. Uh, but there's there's quite a bit out there, and it goes all the way back to actually around 1925. And you may notice that this person has the same last name as me, so it could be a long lost relative. It's definitely not me because I wasn't born in 1925. Well, I wasn't alive in 1925. Uh, but this was a really interesting study, and uh, we we have a bibliography. So if you're interested, I, I would recommend reading it. You probably think that something published in 1925 is not that good, but actually it kind of reads like a pretty up-to-date modern type paper, except for a few things that are maybe a little non-PC. He talks about the bright students and the dull students. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not be appropriate now, but uh, anyway. Uh, so, uh, so there's less research in L2 contexts, but some has been done. I did do a search as well on Google Scholar for uh, EFL students and note-taking and a couple other items. Uh, search items and uh, got about 3,000, 4,000 hits. Uh, so it's definitely less than L1 context uh, research. Okay. Uh, now in both contexts, uh, really research has found that note taking is very challenging. Okay. And uh, and both in the L1 and the L2. And I think you can probably guess from what Andy was saying as well that it's more challenging for uh, L2 learners. Okay, so first a couple of uh, quotations. Uh, again, this is from an L1 context. Uh, so when left to their own devices, students, even college students, do not take very good notes. Uh, they probably only record somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of lecture information. Uh, another quotation, also from L1. Unfortunately, most students' notes are woefully incomplete. Students on average read just I'm sorry, record just one third of important less than ideas. Uh, so the first one was 20 to 40, this is 30, so basically you kind of get the idea for the ballpark figure about what percentage of information students are writing in their notes. And how do you think they get this information? Well, they, <laughs> researchers have to go actually and look at the students' notes and then compare them with the lecture content. And this is an extremely time-consuming process, which is maybe one reason, oh, yeah. one reason that there has not been that much uh, research, at least in L2 context. Okay. okay, oops, sorry, I went too far. How do we go back? Okay. Yes. Uh, so, uh, why is it so challenging? Well, Andy mentioned a couple of things, but just to sort of add to that. Uh, speech rate, average speed rate, one, uh, 120 to 180 words per minute. Uh, this, I found this in, a, in an article about lecturing, so this is referring to the speed of speech in lectures, uh, versus writing speed, 33 words per minute on the keyboard, or 22 words per minute long hand. So obviously, we can speak much more quickly than we can write, okay? So that, that makes note-taking very difficult, okay? Uh, some, in some cases, uh, students have trouble understanding what is important and what is not so important. And obviously that's very important when you can only record uh, maybe what a fourth or so of the information that you're hearing uh, you really have to pick and choose what you're going to write down in your notes okay that can be difficult uh, and just despite the fact that uh, note-taking is extremely important at the university level uh, there really has been uh, there's there's not a lot of instruction in note-taking this, this has been found by researchers who have done surveys of students and in most cases, students have not learned uh, how to take notes in high school or university. Okay. And also fatigue, distractions. You know, if you're, you're sitting in a lecture for uh, 90 minutes or longer and, you know, you get tired. So that can make it challenging uh, to, for note-taking. Okay. What about for L2 learners? What makes it more challenging for L2 learners? Well, cognitive capacity. Uh, I'm not saying that L2 learners have less cognitive capacity. I'm saying that uh, you're working with limited resources. Your brain can only process so much information at, at, at one at a time. Uh, so uh, L2 learners, in many cases, they're concentrating on listening comprehension. They're trying to understand what the lecturer is saying. Uh, and they really don't have any time left to, to think about what they're, what they're listening to and what's important and writing that down. There's just not enough capacity for them uh, to handle that. Okay. And basically the reason is, is you know, less automization of bottom-up listening processes. Okay? If, if you're listening in your first language, basically it's automatic. You're just you're sort of catching the language and processing it automatically. In the case of an L2, that's not the case. Okay? And also uh, less instruction, I'm sorry, uh, lack of instruction on how to take notes. And this, this is the same as I put in the slide for L1 context, but I think 
if the L2 students are not getting training, it, it can have graver consequence, consequences for them. Okay. And certainly plain and simple, just language proficiency. You know, the L2 learners are going to have trouble understanding some things that lecturers are saying. Vocabulary, grammar could be many things, could be cultural things. Yeah, so that makes it a lot more challenging for L2 learners. Oops, I think I did the same thing again. There's a bike book. Yes. Oh, there is. <laughs> okay. Okay, and just a couple of quotations about uh, L2 context. Uh, so combined with the difficulty of listening to lectures, the task of taking notes appears to be ominous, even for, L, uh, even for advanced L2 learners. And this is in an article that was uh, published by somebody who was working at AP, APU down in Kyushu. Actually, he's here at this conference. Unfortunately, he didn't come to the presentation, but uh, anyway. Uh, however, we view the utility of student notes, whether as a process or product, the L2 group are, are at a huge disadvantage, given the fact that they do not adequately record key information. Uh, this was a study in Australia, uh, and actually they found that uh, L2 learners only record about 19% of the main ideas of a lecture, and then for the details, it's, it's a little higher, uh, but, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> They, they, about 19% of the main ideas, and then, I can't remember what it was, but uh, slightly uh, lower for uh, key points and so on. So, uh, so th this is compared to L2, I'm sorry, L1 learners, okay? Okay, so I've talked a little about the challenges of note taking for L1 and L2 students, and uh, we are going to continue now to talk about textbooks uh, there has been not so much research in L2 context about note-taking, but I think the publishers and the teachers are aware that this is a big thing, and we need to teach our learners how to do this. So the, most of the textbooks that um, you may be using in your, in your listening courses probably include something about note-taking. So uh, Jack is going to give an overview of these textbooks. Okay, I'll give it over to Jack. Thank you. Okay. So, a few of the textbooks that I'm going to talk about are um, Academic Listening and Speaking, uh, Lecture Ready, and Listening and Note-Taking Skills. Um, first of all, it's Academic, and, um, academic Listening and Speaking. This is uh, ABAX, um, ABAX, right? Yeah. Based in Tokyo, actually. So, um, I'm going to spend a little extra time talking about this one because it's more unique. Um, so, okay, so the first part, the first listening that we actually do in this textbook is a fill in the blank, a kind of gap fill exercise where um, you don't have as much freedom to organize your notes, but you do have um, a nice structure here that you can go through. So for students that are maybe newer to note-taking, this can be valuable. Um, and then they actually have another gap fill section where you um, are summarizing what you just listened to. So uh, one thing that I noticed is that um, it's not until section five that they start talking about tips, uh, advice on uh, ways to uh, there's different tips in each unit for note-taking advice. For example, here they talk about um, connecting um, by skipping things like is, are, and has. Um, of course, for a gap fill, that's not necessary because all you're doing is writing in other words, but uh, for section four, that probably might have been valuable to be before that. What section four is, is you get in groups of three and each of the students has a transcript, a different transcript, that is related to the main lecture topic, but a little bit different information. And they take turns reading it and taking notes. Um, this is actually some of the most freedom that the students have for taking notes. There's no actual structure, there's just some lines where they can uh, jot down the best notes. So it seems like um, it might be valuable to go over section five first so that they can practice um, that tip in the student mini lectures. Uh, they do have a place here where you can practice 
of that tip with language that is specific to the tip. Um, and uh, uh, one of the valuable things here is that uh, the speed that the lecturer is, is speaking here is much quicker than the previous lectures, so they get to hear a little bit more authentic speed. Um, they then have a reading. Um, I, I will say I wish it was a little bit longer, um, but it is uh, related to the topic. And this is the only textbook I saw. Every textbook I reviewed had a reading related to the lecture. But this is the only one where they require the students to take notes on the reading, which is something I like because taking notes when you're reading is also important. <coughs> um, next, besides the student mini lectures where they have just lines, this is the most freedom they have on the, um, with an actual lecturer. Uh, to take notes. So um, that's one reason this book is unique. They break it down into different sections and have it's very guided on what they're doing with the students. So if your students are new to note taking, um, I found this book valuable when I used it. Um, the other two books are they're similar and a little bit more um, freedom to just take notes in your own style. Um, so next, I'll talk about listening and note-taking skills. Has anyone taught with this book before? Okay. Um, so this one, it does start off by giving some lecture tips. Um, wisely, they put it before the lecture so that you can practice um, the, speak, uh, the tips. Um, this is another example. This one was from Unit 1. The previous one is, I believe it was unit, or chapter seven. Um, here they have a number notation. I noticed in this textbook, they give different abbreviation advice um, throughout the whole textbook. And one thing that we discussed is, um, is it better to give relevant abbreviation advice in specific units, or is it better to have an initial, maybe two or three chapters where they give a lot of more specific guidance for note-taking, or is it better to spread it out? Because um, some of the abbreviations they'll have later in the textbook possibly could have been used earlier. Um, this section I found useful in my classroom. Um, it's basically going through and after you've listened once, you actually have, uh, I believe they call them note-taking mentors, uh, that actually will talk through two examples of notes that you might have taken. And you, um, he then talks about which one he uh, recommends and why. Uh, the reason I found this useful in my students as well is because they can compare it to exactly what they wrote down and see how they could have done it differently, how they could have used some abbreviations that they didn't use, or how they could have um, formatted differently. This, um, this one's listening and speaking skills too, and it um, has these visuals. Um, I know three has a different thing, it's more like a PowerPoint, but uh, that can be useful to um, have something to look at while you're um, listening to the lecture. Another Kind of the same type of thing would be if you uh, actually had a video of the lecture and the professor used a PowerPoint, but this would, is a good um, secondary option. And then they go through a second and a third listening. From what I've heard, this book used to be much more empty and uh, <laughs> basically uh, noteworthy. Uh, they had mostly blank pages and said, <laughs> here, um, here's a nice lecture, take some notes. <laughs> uh, so uh, the newer uh, versions of it, uh, it's been updated and they've added uh, quite a few things which are um, appreciated. So again, even the third listening, all it is is adding some numbers, but again, you can uh, show your students different ways they could have written things down. The lecture ready is the last one I'll talk about. And in lecture ready, um, 
It starts by talking about listening stra strategies similar to the last one. And then it goes on to the reading section. The reading is actually, um, it says reading this lecture introduction, so it's actually the introduction to a lecture. Um, this is the only textbook I saw that actually gives part of a transcript where you can look through um, and identify the lecture language that is talked about. Um, it gives a general outline to identify main topics, and um, then it has some note taking tips. So the first part was lecture language tips, listening for uh, keywords, and then they give tips on how to organize your notes better. Um, it's kind of nice that they separate those two points. A lot of uh, the other textbooks combine them and do one or the other. Um, and then as with all of the textbooks, they go through some uh, comprehension questions. So I, w I went a little bit longer, but uh, I'm curious what your experiences are with these uh, textbooks. Did you have one that you found more useful than others? Does anybody? Just quickly before we start, push that next button, Jack. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, what you mentioned about the tips for note taking, I use contemporary topics, as you guys know, and one thing I found is like, they have like the lecture uh, note-taking tip in each chapter, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing I started a couple years ago is just like I have the students look at those pages for each chapter in the first couple of weeks, right? Because sometimes they're kind of common sense, but sometimes like chapter 12 note-taking then could be very useful from the very beginning, right? Yeah. So that's the point, Mike. Based on that. Yeah. yeah. To have an initial unit. Right? Mm -hmm. So you actually have them look through all of those tips. I've right? done that before, not every semester, but I think doesn't hurt. Right? That's a good idea. Yeah, there's a book called uh, Learn to Listen and Listen to Learn. I'm not yeah, sure yeah. That but that's what they do. They spend the first half half chapters. Yeah. First half of the book, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty intense. Maybe it's too much, but uh, yeah. the idea is good. Mm -hmm. so. I haven't used any of the books, and I'm just curious is there any encouragement of students to develop their own abbreviations and their own way of taking notes instead of learning how to follow? Um, I haven't. I haven't seen it in the curriculum. Have you run into that? No, I certainly tell my students that. And I give them examples of the things I used to do, like yeah. 17th century, 17 with a C over it and stuff yeah. like that, to get yeah. them to do the, to develop their own skills. Yeah. But I don't know any textbooks that stretch like that. Individually, if I'm going to start a lecture for the first time, I ask them, what's it about? What abbreviations can you use? Please oh, write yeah. those down. Yeah. <laughs> Just as a teacher, I do that, but I don't know any text that um, actually. Chris Bill was the Yeah, was it built in? Okay. There's a couple of things that we, we came up with ourselves um, in terms of textbooks. Um, just Mike was saying before about textbooks that do introduction strategies, but you know the abbreviations come in chapter eight of some books. Mm -hmm. So you know going back to this idea that you, know, you actually skip ahead and show them these things. It seems rather absurd that they've done seven chapters before. Hey, you know what? You could cut the words a little bit shorter here, guys. <laughs> seems pretty absurd. Um, so this idea of an initial section like uh, learn to listen, uh, listen to learn. Um, some of the other things that we came up with, Jack was talking about introducing specific formats for particular lectures. And we noticed some textbooks do this, they show different styles of notating for different types of lecture. Um, personal preference, Jack, you prefer uh, listening to notating to, to lecture ready. Yeah. Um, which was because of better focus on note taking skills and not the oral cues, which happens a bit like deleted the BS oral cues, but <laughs> that wasn't appropriate for a presentation. Um, but again, we're kind of curious to hear people's own experiences in terms of textbooks. Do you think any particular <coughs> textbook does a better job than any others? Because so, I mean, we, we probably use basically four different CDs, right? We use Contemporary topics, lecture ready, listening, note taking skills, and alas. Yeah. Yeah. How many people are using textbooks for this kind of thing? No, nobody at all. Just personal preferences, Joe? Ooh, I think the, the new version of 
contemporary topics is better than the bleeding Yeah, that's something. But again, it still sticks with the like, linear outline. Yeah, I think we use contemporary topics as our core text. Um, it's kind of like the best option for our PAP program, I guess. This has the longer lectures, of like what, seven minutes or so. And like uh, Jack mentioned, it gives the students a lot of freedom. It's not just filling the gap, which is the teacher. I don't think that would be good enough for EAP students to get ready for our academic program. Yeah, it's kind of like just the, the best option out there for our program. Um, again, we're going to hopefully get some more discussion later. So we'll Thank you, Doctor. So, yeah. Okay, so as Jack mentioned in the introduction, we're sort of moving towards you know the main thing for today's presentation, which is a four-step process for teaching note-taking. Uh, but we just wanted to give you a little background about you know, how this sort of came about. Uh, and I think we're maybe going a little over. Okay, we're going to be okay. So, I'll just very oops. This is the back button, right? That's the blackout button. That's the blackout button. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so just a little from my own personal experience. Uh, I've, I've been teaching in Japan for about 25 years, although I've only been teaching note-taking the past 10 years or so since I started working at Tokyo University in Saitama. Uh, the previous university didn't really have sort of high enough level students that I could teach note-taking, but currently I'm teaching some fairly high level students. Uh, so, you know, I did this for a few years and I started thinking, mm, you know, this is really hot. It's tough for the students and they're really not improving their note-taking skills. So I started looking, uh, you know, for research on this and, and as I said, uh, there was not that much out there. Uh, so I started doing some of my own research and this sort of gradually led to uh, what we're going to be mainly talking about today. But uh, uh, the first thing I did was a presentation at JAL 2014 and it was called a Study of Note-Taking EFL Listening Instruction. And basically, I just looked at my, my students' progress over the course of a year. And I was using a book called Open Forum, which actually doesn't have anything related to note-taking. <laughs> but, it, but it's sort of semi-academic English. And I was basically making my own materials or getting things from the internet and stuff like that. And uh, you know, looked at the, their improvement in note-taking over the year. And this was extremely time-consuming. I think I mentioned that previously, this kind of research. So basically, you, you have the students take notes. <laughs> collect their notes and then analyze their notes. Basically, I input into Excel everything that they put in their paper <laughs> for, for three tests, which was very time consuming. So, uh, but anyway, over the course of the year, total notations, you know, it could be anything, it could be a symbol, it could be a word, a sentence, or whatever. Uh, so they, they improved their, their ability to, to, you know, in terms of quantity of notes. Uh, so they went from 110 to 208 uh, over the course of a year. Uh, content words, they also increase abbreviation sim and symbols. They got used to use using them more. Uh, arrows, the only thing that they didn't really improve that much on was circles and boxes and underlining. Okay. So, and then, uh, so after I gave the presentation, uh, a guy named Joe Siegel came up and... Can you run over? Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm not... I'm the, old guy here who's not very good with technology. <laughs> I think I'll just use the arrows. <laughs> what happened? Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so after I gave this presentation, uh, a guy named Joe Siegel came up uh, and we spoke and uh, actually a few other people came up, came up and we started uh, uh, communicating via email and we sort of uh, started, you know, talking about some research that we could do uh, on note-taking. And we did a fairly extensive uh, survey of students in Japan about note-taking. We had about uh, 750 students in maybe four or five different universities. And it, w it was a fairly extensive survey. We don't, I don't have time to talk about uh, everything now, obviously, very briefly. Uh, so uh, we asked about their experience with note-taking in high school uh, and university. And as you can see, well, the, the blue here is high school. Uh, so they took basically more notes in high school than they did in university, although probably a lot of this is just copying down from the board, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, and they did more note-taking in non-English classes than English classes. Okay. Uh, and then this is experience with uh, instruction on note-taking. And as you can see, uh, less than half uh, got any instruction in English classes or non-English classes. And when it, when it comes to university, only 13% of students had any kind of instruction on note-taking. Okay. 
in itself. Okay. And uh, Joe, while uh, we were working together, was also doing his own stuff. And uh, he published an article in ELT Journal, which is a fairly prestigious journal, uh, about uh, a pedagogical cycle for EFL note-taking that he developed. And he did this while he was still working in Japan. In fact, he's actually in Sweden now. He moved to Sweden. Uh, the current, uh, he did this when he was teaching at Meiji, I think it was Meiji Bakuri University. And uh, this was a three-step process. This was kind of the, the beginning of his idea for the four-step process uh, that we're going to be explaining. And I guess I won't really spend much time talking about this, but just let me say that this was kind of like a precursor to what we're going to be talking about in the rest of the workshop today. Anyway, uh, so yeah, he developed a system for teaching note-taking and used it over the course of, uh, I think it was one semester. And uh, he had the comprehension tests, uh, the pre-test and the post-test. And uh, in terms of the <coughs> test scores, there was not a significantly larger, uh, statistically significant increase in terms of uh, comprehension, but it, with regard to in, information units that we're going to be talking about later, this is a way that you can evaluate notes, the quality of notes. Uh, there was a significant improvement over the course of the study. Okay, okay so I will pass it back to Jeff, I'm sorry, to Andy. Sweden. I love Sweden. I've <laughs> uh, been a big fan of Sweden for many years, especially since they met this guy, the King of Kings, Henrik Larsson. <laughs> Henrik went on to great success at Manchester United. He helped Barcelona win the 2006 Champions League. And then last year, I found out another reason to love Sweden apart from Henrik. Henrik was something special, but then came last year and Joel, who had moved to Sweden, or probably we mentioned before. Joel basically received a very healthy uh, amount of funding from the Swedish government to conduct a project into note-taking and how to teach you better. And Joe kindly offered, uh, uh, offered the opportunity to, to join them in it. And uh, this was a project seeking to examine how we can best assist our students in developing their note-taking techniques. So Joe's basic idea uh, was the four-step procedure uh, and these two questions. What effect does the explicit four-step procedure for note-taking instruction have on student comprehension of lecture content? as measured by post-lecture tests. In addition, what effect does the explicit four-step procedure for note-taking instruction have on student note-taking performance as measured by the information units that I use when listening to authentic lectures? So students were being assessed in terms of uh, a test following the, 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 the lecture, uh, but then also we were taking a look at their, their notes as uh, Mike already mentioned. The four-step procedure itself we keep talking about four steps, four steps. What are these four steps? Well, the first one, chunking, followed by marking, and then writing verbatim, and simplifying. I'm sure some of you have some idea of what these things are. Um, the model, uh, as Joel uh, built it, was that chunking would be to help note takers segment content into meaningful chunks while de dealing with the standard rate of speech. And uh, to give you a very basic example of this, where would you put the slash lines? Well, this is the way it was done by Joe. I don't know why, but I'm continually amazed to think that two and a half billion of us around the world are connected to each other through the internet. Now, that itself doesn't seem to me overly helpful initially. Um, but the idea of getting the students to, to, to break down chunks of language. They're, they're listening in real time. And rather than just being on blah, 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 you know, just at least be able to pick out where the, perhaps the natural pauses would be. The second one, marking. This is to help the note takers separate the information into various levels of importance and to recognize textual features of lectures, to help in the identification of what should be noted and what maybe should not be noted. And this is a really simplified example I'm going to show you. Um, it doesn't really use symbols and things, marking. Uh, some examples of this could involve actually having students identify all the nouns, etc. But this is really very simple. Today, what many of us would love to believe is that the internet is a private place. It's not. And with every click of the mouse and every touch of the screen, we're like Hansel and Gretel, leaving breadcrumbs of our personal information everywhere we travel through the digital woods, which implies that we want to be followed, I guess. 
don't know why the bread comes from you. <laughs> um, what we're leaving our birthdays and places of residence or interests and preferences or relationships or financial histories and on and on it goes. So to me, this example shows us that we simply circling the main idea, uh, putting a triangle on the supporting idea and underlining the examples. So we very simplified it. Uh, model this. Step three, writing verbatim uh, to help the note takers catch and record the information in real time and to help them recognize which words are important and which are probably not. And we actually had to clarify this several times uh, to make sure what exactly happened. <coughs> Initially, students were being played a minute text, I think it was at the time. And uh, this was found to be too difficult, so then it was reduced to I think about 30 seconds. So this is still very challenging, but 30 seconds of trying to write down verbatim the keywords. Then from this point, step four in the, uh, the, the, the process is to uh, have the students writing down, sorry, step three, sorry, have the students uh, writing down verbatim the exact words, the keywords, not every single word, all the keywords. And again, 30 seconds of pausing it to give them the time to, to finish writing properly. And then step four, to simplify this, to help the note takers practice being more efficient and making effective choices when simplifying the notes. An example, uh, very simply, the internet is not a private place, the internet, not private, leaving personal information everywhere, or info everywhere, for birthdays, residence, interests, and preferences, B day, Adra likes, I personally like Addy, he thought that was fun. <laughs> um, so that's very, very simply what the four steps are. And so the initial process was in Sweden involving a large number of classes in the Swedish University. How many students have been involved in total? Gosh, several hundred. It, it was pretty large, yeah. yeah. Um, all the students took a pre-instruction note-taking test. Um, the students did not see the questions prior to giving lectures. They were given a TED talk, basically, uh, and asked to take notes, and then they were given a test on it. Um, the pre-test was based upon the importance of cave fish. Uh, and the uh, post-intervention after doing the activities, the post-test was another TED talk uh, on the search for life-sustaining planets. Now, these topics were chosen. When I first looked at that, I thought, what the hell? Why would you choose these topics, cave fish? Now, but the reason for these topics being chosen was that students would have some general knowledge of science, but they would clearly need to take notes on the specific content, thereby generating uh, a need for notes. Uh, both were about five minutes long, but they were videos played with the visuals minimized in order to make sure the students were focused on the paper and note taking. Um, students listened once and then were given one minute after the video to complete the notes, after which uh, they went online and took using testimonies, a very basic quiz. Um, and the results, looking at the post uh, pre test and post test, and Joe's results basically didn't really show much improvement in terms of test scores. The pre-test scores, the post-test scores were not that different. However, in terms of their IU capture, uh, there was definitely an improvement in the number of information units they were able to note down in their notes. You could argue the test score, but they took the test so soon after the lecture. Perhaps it wasn't really the notes they were relying on, even though they were supposed to use the notes for answering the, the, the quiz. It may well be that there was so much of the information still in the short term. Um, Mike, do you want to make a comment in terms of the, the, the actual uh, the data? Well, yeah, as you can see, uh, the average score for the pretest was 6.5 and then the post-test was 7.2. I put in so it's not statistically significant the increase. I mean, it is a slight increase, but uh, not significant. But then regarding the IUs? Yes, so for, as he said, with the IUs, so the average number of IUs for the pretest was 6.2. You can see that's a fairly decent uh, uh, jump for the post-test uh, up to 13.3, and that was uh, statistically significant at the 5% level. So uh, definitely uh, they increased their ability to, to write down information units in their notes. We should still say though that 6.2 up to 13.3 double. We're talking about 47 possible IUs and 46 in the post-test, mm -hmm. so it's still Small yes. Following Joe's study, uh, another colleague of ours, Yoko, she uh, conducted a study amongst her students here in Japan uh, in order to compare with the Swedish results. And um, she also introduced a control group 
uh, a group that took the same pre-test and post-test, but uh, did not uh, go through the four steps. Her results, though, um, didn't really produce any significant gain in test scores. <laughs> they went from basically zero IUs to two, or 46 or 47. So, um, yeah. <laughs> And, uh, rather low. Uh, myself, um, given my own context, uh, I often have two NSD classes, note taking speech discussion classes, at the same level uh, each semester. And so um, I was able to conduct this study twice last year. One with an IN level class and intermediate class. They probably 430 in the paper based TOEFL tests, so that would be low B1, very high E2, very low. Uh, the LA, club, uh, LA class, which we do have right now, the uh, low advanced class, uh, their TOEFL PBTs are about 480. Significantly um, uh, better level of English at that point. And um, each time, my morning class was slightly larger, I mean, three or four students larger than my afternoon class, so I had a justification, I had extra time to fill, uh, which allowed me to ethically uh, conduct one group as the control group, and the afternoon group as my uh, my and so my results, well, my results, they were similar to Yoko's. I got nothing. <laughs> um, this is all the individual students and the results. Uh, this is uh, the first control group. Uh, this was the, uh, the, the treatment group for the IN levels. Both numbers went up. We were figuring that's basically because, well, we have been in our EAP, our EAP program for about 10 weeks at that point. Um, the higher students, we <laughs> went from six down to three. Uh, that was the uh, control group. And the, uh, the treatment group were a very small class, but they went from 5.3 down to 5.13. Now, of course, Mike was very kind. He tried very hard to say that one of them was st statistically almost significant. Uh, but I think he was just being nice. Um, but of course, so, being honest about it, this didn't really work very well. Now, the limitations, why, for both Yoko and myself, why did we get nothing useful in terms of results? Well, clearly the subject matter was too difficult for the vast majority of students. We've got to say at this point that the reason for the choice of subject matter, remember, was this idea of using authentic content on which students' performances were less likely to be influenced by any prior knowledge. We also have the thorny issue of information units. Do they all have the same value? Do they all have the same level of importance? And I'll come back to that briefly in a moment. And did we spend enough time on the four steps? Now, based on what we did was we had uh, each of the four steps um, were conducted twice for 30 minute periods. Um, so in Sweden, it was pretty much once a week, 30 minutes on uh, chunking, the following week, 30 minutes on chunking. Then moving on to step two. And so the pre test and post test were about 10 weeks apart, uh, give or take a week, depending on individual class schedules. Um, but perhaps uh, our students, we would to, to have any kind of uh, to see any progress, perhaps we would need to spend longer on each of these. I used the exact same amount of time as was used in Sweden, but for our students, perhaps we need to spend longer. Um, there's also the issue, of course, the differences in the difficulty level of the pre-test and post-test. You know, they weren't identical. There's no way we could have got the exact same level of uh, content. I want to go back to this idea of I use and level of importance. This generated a lot of discussion amongst the people involved in this project. And so what we decided to do was uh, the, the I use had been already decided by Josie Lowe. So what we did was over uh, Christmas this year, last year, we, uh, we each agreed that we would try ourselves to rate the IUs uh, between one and three. Uh, one being a minor detail, two being important but not absolutely crucial, and three being an absolutely vital detail. And what we found, this was five of us conducted this, and this was what we got in terms of our correlations. We're so far off each other. Yeah, TR is teacher researcher, by the way. I was number five. I was number two. Number two, right? Um, not that it makes any difference. I found that my correlations uh, for three were the highest in both cases. And I'm quite curious about why that was. 
Um, the other thing to think is that they're both from the UK. The others were from North America. Maybe that's um, so since then, we've, we've gone on to, to do various other things. We're looking at this idea of different levels of IU. Uh, my, myself, at the moment, I have HB, high beginner classes. And what I've decided to do is replicate the study again with the control group, because again, I have two different uh, sizes of class. And what I've decided to do this time is to uh, use um, Contemporary Topics intro, because we've used this book in previous years at that level. But this semester we're not using that book, we're actually using one of the academic listening and speaking books. So I have some idea of how students deal with that level of uh, lecture. So I'm simply using uh, the first uh, lecture, which is on uh, archaeology, one about Stonehenge, the Kipu, and uh, yeah, the carving. And then the last one uh, about the microfinancing of the bike. And uh, I've already created the little, um, we have already started this. We did the, uh, the pre-test uh, recently. Uh, it's very simple to make using Quizmo, so it's fast to take. One of my own self-criticisms is that the test I've made for this so far simply uses the 10 contemporary topics test questions. I'll just copy them exactly. So 10 questions, is that really an accurate way to assess comprehension of that of those lectures? Um, in terms of, uh, at this point, I think we're coming in for time. We've got seven minutes left to move on, yeah. Um, we're very curious to hear what you guys think. Um, we have a couple of activities as well regarding uh, some ideas of uh, step four, simplifying and note taking. Um, but does anyone have any questions or anything you want to raise at this point? Sure. Uh, you were mentioning um, the, uh, the possibility of a difference in difficulty between first and second videos. Yeah. Uh, what about like switching the order between different classes? Yeah, it's so kind of a simple thing that we could do. <laughs> yeah, yes. that's the sort of things that we're, we're looking for people to give us the right ideas here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that would work in terms of it's just simply too difficult uh, for the students here. Uh, um, okay, so both of the videos were being too difficult. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So if you're yeah. going to look for more simpler ones and just kind of tease out. Yeah, we actually discussed again, that's really the point, but just because this is the first time to try using the contemporary topics once. And again, I'm fully aware it's not authentic language. But perhaps we'd be able to switch those around to the microfinancing one first. That might be worth doing. Thank you. Thanks. Um, what your point? So I have a good question about um, students learning how to take note taking. Um, what kind of level is this geared towards students? Because you know, like listening to lectures in English, you probably have to have a high level Right. Well, see, our students, uh, the Sister College of Lakeland, our students are in a one-year EAP program, and after one year they'll head overseas um, to study in the US or UK generally. And um, so our students are very motivated. And we have all levels. We have HA students who are already excellent command of English and they're learning to write research papers. And then we have the HB students who really are not HB, they're AB, but absolutely <laughs> So again, in terms of the level, this is another thing I'm thinking of it, is doing, at this level, using the very easiest textbook that we have, Contemporary Topics Intro. But we're also thinking about perhaps trying to find a way that we could use Contemporary Topics Level 2, maybe, for the higher level classes. Because I think, you know, try and gauge that. Um, so the idea that, I mean, it's for every level, quite frankly. Um, because whatever level of student you have in the corresponding textbooks, they do have you know, like uh, note taking strategies and things. So we're really looking at pretty much every level. So I have one more question if that's okay. Um, you said in the, uh, the pre test and the post test, I post test with the TED Talks, um, there wasn't a real a major difference between students who. I guess, control group and yeah. Yeah, there wasn't really a major difference. And you said with the, the information units, um, between five researchers, you couldn't really. Do uh, agree upon yeah, what, were the, uh, what yeah. were the most important ones. Um, so if there's no difference between, no real difference between the control group and the experimental group of, um, of the test scores, um, to what um, degree is the effectiveness of teaching or taking if it doesn't really affect the scores? <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Jump out a window. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely. And I think what we're actually looking for, hoping to do is if we can find a framework, and that's actually something we're working on now, trying to find a framework to, 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 to establish different levels of, of IUs, 
then to try and analyze the student's notes, are they able to get the, the level threes more than the twos and the ones, etc. Again, though, this is very much a case, and this is why we want to call this a workshop, because it's very much a work in progress. I stood up here today and said, basically, we did all the research and we failed. <laughs> um, but we've got a lot from it, and we're really looking to develop. And honestly, what we're hoping for is as many people as possible to get involved in. Um, you know, anything I can do, we can do better, as always a kind of the mantra. Is there any else? Did you come across any research on the influence of the students L1? And the writing system, because obviously um, Japanese students are very different to Swedish right. students. Even if they had a similar proficiency level, yes. would the writing system have any influence on the note taking? Um, in terms of the research and that, I think you know, we're so today trying to keep things to a certain area, but it's one of the things that came up, even cultural differences. Mm -hmm. Not just like this, but obviously script writing differences. Yes. Um, what I was a little bit disappointed was that I didn't see, I would have expected the HB students, the, the low students, to struggle with that much more. But even our students who are quite comfortable writing, they're quite fluent in terms of, you know, they make mistakes, but quite fluent in speaking the writing, they didn't do that much better, quite honestly. But certainly an issue often, isn't it? I was just going to. Yeah. 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 I was just going to say, uh, L1 English learners uh, listening to lectures in Japanese and they're trying to write the notes in Japanese, that might be even more challenging than for the Japanese yeah, exactly. to write in English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly an important issue, I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. uh, just piggybacking on that, too. The, even like the you know, structure of presentations and um, you know, how the arguments are made between Japanese and you know, more of the Western style is yeah. so drastically different that it might be interesting to develop a lecture in Japanese and then test them with that same kind of Base ones uh, performed by a native. Absolutely. And, and even and another issue is should students be allowed to take notes in Japanese? I think it's another whole issue as well. We only have a minute left, guys, and so we're not going to, we, we have handouts in terms of these little activities, but it's not really worth giving out. But one thing, though, I think it's worth just for a little. You don't want to. You want to. This is going to be the, the trying to identify the IUs themselves. Um, but this idea is simplified. Um, the United Kingdom's population, around 60 million, is similar to that of Italy, but Italy's population is now shrinking because the birth rate has fallen below its death rate. The UK's population is still growing up very, very slowly at a rate of 0.09% between 1995 and 2000. Uh, this is taken from a handout here from the University of Portsmouth. Uh, let me actually copy this. What we did was at the bottom, it tells you the same. Um, here, this actually showed you how you should take notes on that text. What we did is we cut that. We're going to give you a chance to try yourselves how you would abbreviate that note, uh, this language. So I want to visualize, imagine how you would abbreviate this, simplify that down to the bare bones. Anybody? UK part. Here we go. Wow. So that's, what we're, that's what we're hoping our students are going to be able to get to. So <laughs> we're a bit of a ways off. Uh, but guys, we're pretty much out of time, unfortunately. There's a lot of other things that we would have been happy to talk about as well. But um, again, anybody have any final comments, questions? Okay, thanks very much for coming, sir.